Uh, my first question just uh, to everybody is, so how far up to Columbia have you been? Like how many of you have been up to, let's say Beacon Rock? And how many of you have been Hood River, Hood River or maybe beyond Bonneville Locks? Tri cities. Oh, nice. very cool. Okay, so that's uh, that's that's one of the one of the destinations, kind of one of the one of the places. So Tri Cities being Kennewick, uh, Kennewick area, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we are Peter and Adrian from Amazing Grace, and um, the uh, our membership actually was formally approved on our downstream arrival back to Portland. So we're very recent SIYC members. And uh, we're also relatively uh, new keelboat owners. Uh, we purchased Amazing Grace in 2019 and uh, very timely just before all the pandemic and uh, uh, no other international travel of which we used to do quite a bit. Um, but our, our uh, previous boating experience was uh, racing uh, Flying Scots on a local lake in Dallas, Texas, where we're based out of. Uh, doing some charters, um, both in Thailand, in Europe. We've done just different different experiences on other people's boats. And then we finally decided that it was time to um, have something of our own. So um, so we started kind of exploring and, and looking around of what, what the options were. And uh, we found our uh, lovely boat in, in Portland. And we just said, okay, that's that's good enough for us. Uh, that's, that's where we're going to be and spend some time aboard. So um, been enjoying it very much for the last two and a half years. Uh, just to give a little perspective, uh, uh, in the last two and a half years that uh, we've owned the boat, we've spent aboard about 270 days. So we've, uh, we've definitely made some uh, good use out of, uh, uh, out of the purchase. Um, yeah, so our most important crew member um, I'm going to introduce, which is um, Karina. Um, she spent 11 of her 13 years so far as an indoor, totally pampered um, cat with two sisters, and both of them passed away, um, sadly, right around um, pre-COVID and then into COVID, so we found ourselves with an only child once travel started opening back up, so we decided if we're going to start living aboard, she's going to have to adapt, so she quickly um, <laughs> became Adventure Kitty, and she took over the helm and um, you will see her on and off through this presentation because she is now also the Admiral and oversees all of our projects and lets us know if we're doing things correctly or not. Um, but for any of you considering felines aboard, um, it's amazing how adaptable she was. It took her about three days to be like totally at home and doing her thing. Yeah, we're just her, we're just her loyal subjects on board, <laughs> making sure that she gets new view every so often. Um, so our, our boat, uh, just again, just so you have a little bit of perspective of what we're cruising on is it's a 37 foot Southerly 115. It's a British made boat, uh, with a swing keel for those of you perhaps on YouTube. Uh, if you're following distant shores, uh, they've had three now, three I think three Southerlies now. Um, so that's like just one of the, one of the channels that kind of has made it a little bit popular. Um, but very well made boat uh, with a with a swing keel so we can go from a regular draft of six feet eight inches to about two feet six inches about 30 inches, uh, which, uh, which makes it a lot of fun. Our air draft is 52 feet one inch, uh, which is going to be very interesting when you uh, see on one of the subsequent slides, uh, some of the bridge height limitations. Uh, and you will see 51 feet and change there. So uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, we've got a 39 horsepower Yanmar, so that'll be relevant in terms of the currents. Uh, we, we've actually on the trip rewired uh, the, the house bank, which we'll talk about some of the preparations we did. Uh, we do have some solar, not, not a whole lot, but enough to kind of top us off and, and keep us at anchor or away from shore power for a handful of days. And um, also of interest of this boat is that um, this boat was, this is us being beached actually on one of the lower Columbia sloughs. Um, but this boat was owned previously by um, Kate and Fred Cadelli, who were uh, SIYC members back in the late 80s and early 90s. And they took this boat from Portland down the West Coast, Mexico, Central America, Panama Canal, 
uh, up the Eastern Caribbean, Eastern seaboard, et cetera. So they did this over about four years, uh, wrote two books about it that are available on Amazon. So um, as we like to say, the boat has uh, way more interesting of a pedigree than, uh, than we do. Um, and certainly the boat can handle way more than, uh, than we can. And it's super fun when we read the books to read the stories in the context of us actually being on the boat in the books um, because every little technical problem they talk about or every little detail, we're like, oh yeah, that's that same thing that we're experiencing with that back window or whatever. So uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, so quick summary of our trip. It was 384 nautical miles each way. Um, we started at um, Hadley Landing um, up on the Multnomah Channel on the outbound, and then we counted it as ended there at Government Island when we met up with the SIYC team for the Halloween cruise. Um, so we went through 20 bridges, um, one of which was borderline close to our air draft and gave us a lot of pause, um, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, Peter's going to talk a little bit more about the bridges in a second. Um, but we also went through eight dams and locks. Um, and one thing was interesting. We were watching something about the Panama Canal, and I came to realize that the bridges and locks we went through are nine times the um, vertical change than all of the six locks in the Panama Canal. So the locks on the Columbia and Snake River are quite deep and um, probably really good training ground for getting used to running locks um, because they're pretty, um, pretty dramatic changes. Um, so here's a map of where we went. We took the Columbia River up to the Tri-Cities area, which is a little bit past the entrance to the Snake River, um, up into Richland, which is the furthest north you can go on the Columbia because of a lot of the depth issues there. And then we came back down the Columbia to jump onto the Snake, and took the Snake River up to Lewiston, Idaho, which is the furthest inland port in North America that you can get to. Um, and only a bridge kept us from going further on that one, which we'll talk about in a second. And one thing about that entire route is that that is the opposite route of the Lewis and Clark expedition. So every single place we stopped, there was either a monument or a museum or some sort of plaque marking that specific place and what happened. So it was an amazing tour of history to just gather that information along the way at each little stop and kind of understanding more about the whole Lewis and Clark adventure. So if you're a history buff, it's a lot of fun. And aptly, it's Lewiston, Idaho, and Clarkson, Washington, those twin yes. cities across the river. So very, That's... very appropriately named for the destination. Um, so just to give you an idea, and, and if you can't tell from the big smiles on our faces that uh, we had a lot of fun putting this presentation together, and we uh, have a lot of fond memories of this trip, so we could talk way more than uh, the time allotted right now. But uh, if, if any of you have any details or any questions or or are planning even part of this trip in the future, let's say you want to go up to the Tri-Cities or just, you know, maybe up a couple of dams or something like that, please don't hesitate to, to reach out for like the nitty gritty details. We're going to try to give you a broad overview and hopefully inspire you to, to plan a trip and go somewhere. Uh, but, uh, but if you have some specific details, we're certainly happy to provide and, and let you know what we, what we've experienced and what we have. So uh, prevailing winds, um, as, as is usual on the Columbia, so there were days where it was completely still and flat and you couldn't tell the uh, you know, one foot depths from the, from the 50 foot depths on the river. And um, there were a lot of times where uh, we had to hole up for a couple of days because it was just way too windy to get out there. Um, and uh, some days it wasn't just the, um, the wind in particular, but it was the wind against current, which again, most of us are familiar with but it really does give you a, a very different experience. Um, one place I can remember, I mean, we had several places where, um, but coming into Arlington, uh, there was just very narrow, relatively narrow uh, channel between you know, two canyons. So the wind was howling through and we went from a pretty you know, nice leisurely sail uh, downwind and upstream. It was a lot of, a lot of sailing and um, and we just flipped it just flipped around and it started piping up and the and the um the wind against current in our experience has created and we actually counted it once we were ashore 
Um, we counted that the, uh, the timing between the, the waves was about three or four seconds. So for those of you that have been out on the ocean, um, you know, it's not always just the height of the wave, it's, it's, the, it's the frequency and on the river, uh, the frequency will toss you around. Uh, so that, that, was a, that was a big difference. Uh, currents that we've experienced, uh, obviously right above the dam is always the calmest. Uh, below, the, uh, below the dam, especially Bonneville, uh, the Dalles like uh, got yeah. six plus. So there is, uh, there is some need for a little bit extra horsepower at times, but, uh, but it is all doable. Um, it is all doable. Uh, depths uh, vary widely, um, but it is a commercial channel all the way to Lewiston, Idaho. So if you stay in the channel and communicate, and we'll talk about uh, how we had to communicate with the different commercial traffic, et cetera. But if you stay in the channel, um, you're fine. Uh, it's not always uh, well charted. Uh, we used a number of apps. One of, uh, one of the ones that we enjoyed was CIQ, uh, where you can download the free US Coast Guard maps and um, it'll show you the channel, it'll show you everything. Um, so it's, it's a good navigation. Of course, we had our chart plotter and several other things, including a lot of upgrades that we did along the way. So down in the lower Columbia, we, you, you get to see a lot of the ocean going ships um, and perhaps get into a relatively close proximity of those. Um, on the upstream, you get uh, the barges. Um, we saw a lot of, relatively a lot of commercial traffic, uh, very little uh, pleasure craft. But the commercial traffic, uh, they were all very cordial. Um, it just required a little bit of coordination, which uh, we always tried, especially coming in and out of locks. I think uh, at least half the time we were going through a lock, it required some kind of coordination uh, with the commercial traffic. So um, there was always uh, something exciting going on. For those of you that uh, enjoy some other water sports, uh, Hood River was an amazing place to pull into because the winds were just between 15 and 20. So needless to say, we literally had dozens and dozens, probably a couple hundred of uh, windsurfers and kite boarders yeah. and, and all of those people just zipping around the boat. And of course, to us, the biggest concern was please don't fall down in front of us because we can't stop on a dime. And then we just <laughs> had to realize that they're all adults. Uh, so they're going to have to take their own responsibility. But um, it was uh, it was a pretty fun uh, experience and we've we had a couple of these experiences uh, one was around Arlington so and that kind of also indicates usually where the winds are pretty steady and pipe up heavily so if you're seeing kite borders in the distance and it's uh, five knots where you are uh, that's probably blowing probably blowing 15 or 20 wherever wherever you see them ahead so uh, we had a we had a really interesting time with that yeah one great thing on the kite borders um First of all, us being under sail and them, of course, being under wind power is just a very almost poetic feeling of sailing right through the middle of them. But we had one guy one time down by Cape Horn sail right behind the back of um, our boat, singing Amazing Grace at the top of his lungs um, as we're sailing down, you know, on wing on wing. So it just kind of was that magical moment of understanding just the unity of people being on the water. It was very cool. Um, so quick summary of the timing of our trip. Um, we took right at 31 days to go upstream. Um, we could have done it quicker, um, but we really were not in the mood to rush. We were underway for 21 days. So we decided to stay in some of those locations a day or two, um, obviously for 10 of those. But we spent most of our time under sail on the upstream. Um, the winds were coming mostly from the west. Um, yes, it was a little wind against current and the winds would get up to you know 25, 30. But as long as we just, you know, kept an eye on things, we were just really having fun with it. And um, that 55 hours of motoring includes the eight locks, which is at least an hour, probably a little more going through each of those locks. So most of the time on the upstream, we were under sail, which was surprising. pretty surprising and pretty amazing. Yeah. We were promised on the downstream um, by all of the charts and things we were reading that, oh, yeah, by mid-September, the winds are going to turn and they're all going to come from the east. Well, not really. Um, so we didn't get quite as much sailing in on the downstream as we wish we would have um, because the winds kept pushing from the west and um, howling through there as well. Um, but we spent a little more time on the downstream 
um, but only spent 20 days underway because it was a lot of going into the wind. So we would pick our days carefully and just go a little further when we um, when we made the hops down. Um, and of course, we had a target date of um, being at Government Island by I think it was what the 22nd or 24th of October. Uh, no, 23rd. Yeah, I've got it in there. So um, yeah, we we were kind of on a mission and knew that we wanted to be there for that. So we spent, I guess, about two thirds of the time motoring on the downstream, but still, I mean, 34 hours of sailing was not bad. Um, just not quite as much as we did on the upstream. Yeah. And, it, and it was uh, it was also nice to have a little bit of help from, from the current uh, on the downstream. So everything that we fought on the way up, uh, we got help on the way down. And uh, from the 121 hours that, uh, that we were underway in total motoring, uh, for our 39 horsepower Yanmar, uh, it took about 35 gallons of fuel for those of you with uh, some like range anxiety yeah. and everything. And we'll talk, as a matter of fact, on the next slide, I have it where um, we created, we, we had as much fun planning this as, as doing the trip. And we planned it for quite a, quite a bit in, in advance. And so we just went through and had an entire spreadsheet with multiple tabs as far as what facilities, what are the dams, what are the bridge heights and all of that kind of stuff. So this is just an example of how we mapped out where, you know, where on the river we were. Um, on the Columbia in general, we had no problem with like water, shore power, um, pump outs, things like that. On the Snake River, it got, uh, it got much thinner around there. That's, uh, that was really as a matter of fact, there was no fuel between, um, between Kennewake, so between the, the end of the Snake River and going all the way up to Lewiston. And I don't even there think- There was no, nothing to Clarkston. Yeah. And I don't think in Clarkston, there was any kind of, uh, any marina- There was no diesel, actually. No diesel. There was yeah. only, yeah, there was only gas. There was a couple of places along the way that had gasoline and uh, and no diesel. And I'm, I'm not sure that uh, in Lewiston, there was availability for that, but- uh, Kennewick had a couple of different places um, that that you could refuel that were very convenient. Um, same thing on the Snake River, uh, North Shore Power. Um, I think we had one in Boyer Park. Yeah, that was the mm -hmm. only place. So there was one place along um, that we had. So in return, and you no get, cell phone signal. Yeah, either. no cell phone signal. So <laughs> the moment we went from about mile 10 or 11 on the Snake River all the way up to about 135, so five miles outside of Lewiston, there was no cell, cell phone signal. And the Wi Fi in the two marinas that we found, uh, one literally was a satellite up. Actually, it's this marina on the picture. So they said they're like, our satellite is up here on the hill and it's on a solar power. So if it's cloudy by three o'clock, don't count on having internet connection. Um, so, you know, so, you, so you had to plan for it and, and that obviously affects, uh, ability to download weather and things like that. Um, and again, shore power was pretty limited at this particular marina at Lyons Ferry. We actually spent the night at the fuel dock and then they had about a 200 foot power cord running down. An extension so, cord down the hill. Yeah. Huh? Extension cord that was just kind of laying there. So it was good to have some some adapters from you know a regular 110 extension cord to the the shore power that we needed, et cetera. Um, but uh, but it was totally worth it because it it allowed us to just unplug and go and be self reliant, which is exactly what we were looking for on this trip. Yeah. So weather conditions. Um, I think Craig mentioned something about every climate imaginable. Um, you guys remember last summer? It was like record hot, like had never been before. Um, and that made it for a really rough start in August. Um, we had every made up kind of gypsy sunshade you could imagine. Um, you can see there are my two little colorful scarves, but we ended up pulling everything out of the um, cabinets that was even halfway like a square piece of cloth and just pinning it all around the boat just to create some <laughs> of control of the heat. Um, but the skies were amazing. Um, I already mentioned the winds were coming from the um, west most of the time. So we got just tons of beautiful downwind sailing. Um, and then on the upstream, uh, or I'm sorry, on the downstream, the weather turned while we were in um, Clarkston and Lewiston. And it was so amazing to see the dramatic difference of summer becoming fall. Um, it went from that blistering heat to all of a sudden we wanted our diesel heater on. 
And um, it was kind of a chill in the air and everything's still super dry up on the snake. So you still get all the basalt cliffs and you still get the, um, the super desert landscape. The but nice. the sun goes down super early. Um, and then once you get to the Dalles, everything all of a sudden became wet and the Portland that you guys know. Um, and every time we go walk on shore, it was from desert dry to mushrooms everywhere and just humidity and thickness and cold. Um, so it was such a dramatic change. It was kind of surprising that we were only going, you know, as slow as we were and to see so much climate change going on. So let's talk about some of the fun parts of the logistics aspect. So, um, there was a couple of bridges that gave us pause. One was in the Tri-Cities area. And this particular bridge that's even on the picture, um, I remember ahead of time, maybe three months in advance, calling the bridge. They, they had a published number, which made it into our spreadsheet and everything else. And I called the, uh, the bridge operator and they answered the phone. And I said, um, I'm just verifying what's your fully open height. And he says, um, yeah, well, we can do, he said, some number and for maintenance. Maybe 51, maybe yeah, 52. Maybe 52, maybe 54 for maintenance. And I said, okay. I said, well, we've got a little bit over 52 foot draft. And they said, normally when we go through bridges, we just tell them we need 55 feet. Um, you know, can you do that? And his answer was, well, why don't you just pull up to the bridge and we'll eyeball it? Um, <laughs> which was not the answer we were looking for, obviously. Um, a, because obviously we don't want to hit anything with the mast, and B, because um, as you go upstream, the places to stop are further and, and few in between most, you know, even if they're not too far apart, uh, they're few in between. And it's Peter, not, where was this bridge? This is just outside of Kennewick. This is just outside. This is the Kennewick Railroad Bridge. So as you as you go up to Columbia, uh, Snake splits off uh, to your right, going kind of north northeast, and then we continued into uh, towards, towards Kennewick and Richland. And uh, this is just before Kennewick. So this this first bridge right here on the on the slide is the Kennewick Railroad Bridge, and then the second bridge behind it is what they call the Kennewick Cable Bridge, and. Um, at least, I guess, at least this uh, this particular railroad bridge could raise, and obviously we made it. We made it through um, this cable bridge that's just behind it. That's a fixed bridge. That one, that one's not going to move anywhere, right? And um, as we left uh, our prior place, the Walla Walla Yacht Club, which we'll talk about in a, in a, in a bit, um, we saw one of the American cruise liners going by and cruise ships, and we called up the captain and said, where are you headed to? And he's like, oh, I'm headed, you know, we're going to Richland. We're like, that's great. We're like, what's your air draft? Because we are having some concerns. So, you know, and we talked to him and he said, yeah, I go, I go under. And he says, I have a, I have a few inches to spare. And he was 53 feet and, and change. So we were like, okay, if you can make it, then you can make um, it, we can make it, you know, obviously he's, he's much broader. Um, so, so we knew we, if we went dead center and we did get warned on a couple of occasions i mean obviously there is some bridges like this one just uh, above uh, bonneville dam which is the bridge of the gods some of you may have driven across it um, and, uh, there is a lot of other bridges that um, if you go under and we got some advice they're like if you go under offset yourself from the light because there was actually somebody at one of the clubs that told us they're like yeah i went through and i ended up hitting the light with my mast so um, so we tried to take all of that into account and we ended up at this lovely bridge on the Snake River. This, this one really gave us consternation because again, it's another railroad bridge. It's a fixed bridge. And I checked about five different charts and I got three different answers as far as what the height is of this bridge. And one of the- We're all right around 51, 52 feet. It's yeah. all right on the edge. And so the official height is 51.8 51 feet. And when I was researching the charts, I realized that 51.8 feet is different than 51 feet, eight inches. Um, and literally every, every little bit mattered. Um, so the good news was earlier in the year, we had our mass down and we had everything measured down to, to the inch. So we knew exactly our antennas, exactly how much was up to the deck. Uh, so when we came up to this bridge, and again, we called up another captain on... Uh, as this legacy as this legacy yeah that's a, like that smaller on cruise ship right so we called them up and um actually you called her up and uh, it was a lady captain so she was 
quite chatty with us. And she says, yeah, she says, uh, when the water is like this, we can, we can make it under. And um, she was also like 52, 53 feet. So the other impact of these bridges is as, as you go under or as you go through is that uh, all of the barges have to take down their antennas. They're all built to, to about 52 feet. So you'll end up hearing, uh, or what we ended up hearing a lot on the, on the radio was when they were at one dam, they would say, and they say, hey, can you call ahead to the next dam and tell them I'll be there in two and a half hours. And we, we found it very strange, particularly on the Snake River that they were calling ahead like this. And we're like, why aren't they just you know calling by radio? So again, we ended up talking to one of the captains on the barges and he explained to us that uh, when they get to a certain point, they all take down their antennas so they can get under these bridges. So, so bottom, yeah. bottom line is if you are 52 feet or less, uh, you're good to go all the way to Lewiston. If you are about 54, 55 feet, you can make it to the Tri-Cities. Um, and if you are under, I think it was 42. 42 yeah. So this is the bridge that connects Clarkston to Lewiston, and it cannot open any higher than 42 feet. So that was that was the end of the road for us um, because we can't get under that one. So um, that the, defined the end of our trip. And it's it's uh, from from everything we read, this bridge, even if we could fit under it, uh, they're very reluctant to open it. You have to call a day or two in advance. Um, same is true for like the Hood River Bridge. So if you have particularly taller mast, um, I don't remember the exact clearance there, but we were able to fit under without any issues. Uh, but if you need to, some of these bridges to open, you have to call in advance. Um, this bridge, if you, even if you were to fit under and they were to open it for you, because the unopened height is maybe 12 feet. Yes. Um, so it's a very low to the water. But the, uh, the Snake River starts to be free flowing probably within five or six miles upstream of this bridge. So it's not like you're going to go and um, do a whole lot of exploration. I think there is one very shallow marina beyond, beyond this bridge. So we, we went and um, this, this was the end of the road for us. Yeah, one thing on that other bridge, the, um, the one right above Lions Ferry, which is on the Snake River, um, we were calculating down to how much water is in the water tanks, how much fuel is in the fuel tank. So how low is that going to put us in the water? Um, we had a backup plan that one of us was going to climb up the mast and take down the antenna if it became a problem. I mean, we had every possible way of thinking about how do we make it if we're really only, you know, four inches short, we still want to go the rest of the way. Yeah. So, and, and we'll talk a little bit later as far as uh, how empty it was on the river. So even when we pulled in somewhere or tried to talk to some of the local resources and say, have you been up? It's, it seemed like wherever we were, people would not, ha had not explored pretty much more than like 10 miles away from uh, where their home base was. So we saw very little, uh, a lot of fishing boats, but other yeah, than that. A lot of that, pontoons and fishing, like yeah. little local fishing boats. <laughs> Um, so this is a this is a great map I, I uh, pulled down and again gives a good visual as far as where the dams are and the elevation. Uh, so it, it, it's four four dams on the uh, on the Columbia and four uh, four on the Snake. Um, again, Columbia we know it it kind of meanders. It's a little wider, a little narrower. But then um, in particular on the lower Snake, I mean there's a couple other places on the Snake where things got pretty narrow. And um, in one place, uh, just below the Ice Harbor Dam, as we got onto the Columbia River, I mean, on the Snake River, it was literally you were in the channel and the depth was 20 plus. And we were just by the, by the markers, just floating by them. And we veered off just ever so slightly out of it. And suddenly we were in like low single digits. I mean, it was, it was pretty dramatic how clear uh, the channel was. Um, so that was, that was something we had to pay attention to, but, um, we had a couple of experiences prior on at the Bonneville dam, uh, we've gone up we've to Hood river down. and up and down. So we had a little bit of an idea, uh, but, uh, it, it's, uh, going through the locks is, is different. Um, the locks to give you an idea are 86. They're all built to the same size standard. They're 86 feet wide and 670 feet long. And to kind of give you an idea of what happens uh, when these big barges, some of them that you see are like double wide and double long. Uh, those barges are 84 feet wide and about 650 feet long. 
And as we talk to some so of the one foot on each side, yep, to we, spare. we talk to the lock <laughs> operators and they say, yep, they can pull into this dam, get raised up and get out without ever touching the wall. So um, those those captains know what they're doing. Uh, but at 650 feet long, you have to realize that's more than two football fields. So uh, when you see them on the river, it gives you a different level of respect as far as um, uh, it gives you a different level of respect as far as uh, what's what kind of skill they have. Um, yeah. Peter, somebody needs to mute their uh, their system. We're getting a lot of bleed through from one of the uh, one of the listeners. Okay. I'm just gonna keep a mute. Everybody, all right, good deal. Um, yeah, in the in the summer, thanks for the reminder. In the in the summer uh, summertime, so between uh, Memorial Day and Labor Day, uh, and the dates vary from year to year, but generally it's Memorial to Labor Day. They have a pleasure craft schedule through all these locks. And again, you're going to see much more awareness even of this on the, on the Columbia than on the snake. Um, it, on the upstream, pleasure craft have priority at uh, 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and 6 p.m. Um, on the upstream and then on the half hour afterwards, so uh, 9.30, 12.30, 3.30, 6.30 p.m. on the downstream. And they came in handy in... in in one of the uh, uh, one of the experiences we had going uh, going through the dam, because uh, we were waiting for our lock through, and uh, as we were going through, as one of the barges was interested in in going going with us. So, um, but some of the some of the logistics of going through. Yeah. yeah, in that particular case, we were waiting for our preferred time slot, which is when we're supposed to be priority. And a barge apparently was running behind schedule and you could hear him talking back and forth to the dam that he was anxious to get through. And he made a suggestion to the lock master that because the tug is less than half the width of the double barge, of course, that he was thinking it would be a fantastic idea if that sailboat could just kind of go in with him um, next to his tug. And that way we could all just go through together. And we knew better than to interject our opinion into that because we're not the boss, because that was pretty far up. I think that was actually the lower monumental, um, pretty far up the snake where pleasure crafts are not really, you know, kind of respected as the main traffic. So we sat quietly and I was so nervous just going, they're not going to make us do that, right? And then finally, after about three or four minutes, the lockmaster came back on and said, nope, sailboat goes alone. And um, you're just going to have to wait. And we were just both so relieved, just envisioning ourselves tucked up in that little corner next yeah. to the. And 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 the the reason why it's important. I mean, obviously, we like to have a little bit of elbow room, but um, the filling speed these uh, these locks can fill. They can they have the ability to fill or empty them in about ten or twelve minutes. And uh, when the commercial traffic goes through, uh, they pretty much go at full speed. Yeah, they uh, they crank it up and they go at full speed, which was, uh, we, we were used to going through the Bonneville Dam and we thought, oh, okay, everybody knows how to do with pleasure craft and everything else. And that came back to bite us very quickly uh, at the Dallas Dam. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so when we got tied up in the Dallas Dam, we were feeling potentially a little cocky, feeling like, hey, we got this because we'd been through the Bonneville probably a dozen times by that point. So this was our first time going to the next one. And we got tied up and we thought we were doing good. And normally what we do in the Bonneville is for the um, block through, I will put the front mooring line on the midship cleat and then go around the bit and then stand up close to the bow. And then Peter will go from the stern um, the cleat and up around the bit and back to the stern where he can also be at the wheel. Um, and that all, has always worked fine. It never gave us pause yeah. until the Dow's Dam put on full speed um, as we were going up and the turbulence started going. And without having any additional loop on my line, I was just from midship around bit to the bow, the strength of that line pulled, even you know, with my full body weight, with you know, gloves and pulling and the line just kept pulling out and out and out from my hands. And the boat was spinning to where the bow was coming off the wall. 
and I was envisioning if I let go of that line that the boat was going to spin and then we, we would have no control to not be whacking against those walls. So I had my whole body weight down and like standing on the line and I was down to the last little nub of that mooring line. Um, and there were several moments when I said, I'm not going to make it. And, um, but I did, thank God. Um, but yeah, it taught me that from now on, we do the mooring line from the bow cleat back to the bit, loop it around one more, um, one more time so that that way, by the time I'm holding it on the bow, there's actually a double back. So I've got way more leverage on that line. Yeah, the 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 log masters. Every time we asked afterwards, and we told them, "Hey, take it easy, go half speed." Um, there is definitely uh, a difference, a marked difference. So here's one picture where we're uh, where we're tied against the bit. Um, again, on the upstream, it's a little bit more turbulent because the water's filling in. Um, so you can you can definitely see it and feel it. Um, and uh, on the Dallas, when during this experience that Adrian was describing, part of the reason why we got a little bit cocky is because usually at the beginning and at the end, it's pretty slow, but it's that middle 80% that can get pretty turbulent. And we were just in the first 10%. We're like, oh, this is a, this is a piece of cake. We're like, did they have microphones here that just crank <laughs> it up for us? Um, but it was a it was a good experience to kind of always be aware, always uh, always be on alert. Um, they they always ask whether you know how many people are on board do you have your pfds on um you know have you been through locks before all those kind of questions so uh, the more communication the better is the bottom line peter would it have been an option to take the free end of the line and put it around a cleat so that you you, you lead it around the bollard and then then down to a cleat it, it would have been an option they they specifically tell you not to pleat your lines just in case there's something going on or the bit gets stuck uh, but having it just looped around the cleat initially instead of just holding it in hand obviously would have given more leverage but once the line was loaded there was no way bringing it bringing it down to a cleat uh, so that was and they do say not to tie it off because that's actually one of the lock rules is you're not supposed to tie off your lines so yeah, no, I was just thinking just uh, having a single turn around the cleat to yeah. give you and some I, additional yeah. friction. That's how we did it every time after afterwards. That. That, that's how we did it every time afterwards. We learned. We the learned. one that we put our snubber on up in the anchor well, I, when I pulled it back, I would loop it around that cleat that we put the snubber yeah. on. So another another interesting thing of going through the locks, this is uh, one of those guillotine style dams. Um, so as we were approaching, uh, the winds kicked up to about 25 to 30 knots, uh, not exactly from a, from a stern, not exactly what you want to have going into this uh, concrete tunnel. And um, so as, as we're approaching, I mean, I'm pretty much in neutral and just, just being pushed in by the wind. And I radioed to the, um, I, I got on the BHF and talked to the lock master. And I said, hey, I said, if you could help me out and start closing that guillotine door uh, as soon as we're past it, just so we can block some of the wind and we can be in, more in control of, uh, of our boat and tie up to a bit, I said, we'd really appreciate it. And he's like, yeah, that's against the rules. That's against the procedure. No go, you know? Yeah, can't start closing till you're fully secured. And we're like, okay, well, we're just going to work with what we've got, you know, a little bit more reverse and use that port kick to our advantage. Um, it wasn't 30 seconds later, we were still in front of the uh, the gate and he, he calls us back. He says, that pleasure craft that's entering the lock. Um, I talked to my uh, supervisor and we got an approval to help you out. So um they they again they, they're pretty nice people um and uh, they they may not have all that experience with pleasure craft but as long as we communicated we found that it was a that was a really good experience um this is another uh another one of those dams we took a picture of every dam as we went through this was uh, uh i think That's the lower monumental. lower monumental yeah um but uh every time we went through uh, again it was just a lot of communication uh and sometimes surprises uh in this particular one we were coming in so our thinking was always use the one on the port side because the port kick as i'm shifting in reverse pulls us closer to the wall um and generally speaking we don't like to take the very first bit uh there's usually four bits per side right so the and the bit is floating bit so it moves along with your boat so you just loop around and that should be all there is to it well 
we came in, there was wind blowing from a stern. So we don't like to take the first one because generally you have a little bit more speed. There is the door closing one way or another. Uh, there's water splashing. So, and, and we don't want to take the last one either because after that there is a wall and um, you know that, that does not leave any margin for safety. So generally speaking, we go for the second bit uh, in there, in the lock. So we're coming in and, and again, the wind's pushing us in. Um, coming up to the second bit, and I, we just got too much speed, too much wind pushing us from behind. And instead of saying, hey, let me struggle with it and everything else, I just told Adrian, I said, I'm going for the next bit. And that would have been a perfectly valid alternative until we got about, oh, I mean, the bow was maybe only 20 feet away from that third bit. You can see bit. the channel. Yeah. You can see in the, in the kind of a cutout in the wall. And we realized it was missing the bit. So now we're down to the very last bid, which is right up front against the against the, the upstream gate and the wind's pushing us in. And I'm like, if we miss that one, we're just going straight in. So obviously I didn't like that alternative. So I looked at Adrian and I, and I hauled at her, uh, called, called out to her at the bow. I said, I'm making a U-turn and her eyes just popped <laughs> wide open. But in that in those 86 feet that, that it's wide, I was able to kind of do a you know three or five point turn. And then we tied up facing downstream. So we're still tied up on port. We're still tied up in the middle of the lock. Now we confused the heck out of the lock operator because he's up there in his little cabin and he's like, I don't see you in here. He was all we confused. Were, he's like, where did you guys go? I don't see you. We were tucked, <laughs> tucked down underneath him. And then of course, once we got up, we had to turn around again and, and get out of the lock. Um, so being open-minded and being creative helped us out. Um, it, was, it was a little bit of an unusual experience, but all of that to say is, you know, we don't wanna discourage anybody uh, with, uh, with the locks. It does take a little bit of practice. Uh, I would say certainly minimum two people, three or four is certainly helpful, especially if you're doing it for the first time. Um, Bonneville by far has the most experience with pleasure craft and they will guide you through, they will talk you through it. I remember the first time we went through Bonneville, I was on the phone, I was on VHF and they were just calmly talking me through every little thing. They actually really appreciated it. We were so interested in kind of understanding, uh, all the different aspects of it. So, um, it's an interesting experience, but again, I would not discourage you. Um, the other part for all of us sailors. Uh, with a big stick uh, pointing up. Uh, di different dams have different bridges. Uh, some do, some don't. Uh, Bonneville included, I think their air draft is uh, just under 50 feet. So uh, if, you, if you've got a mast, uh, let them know ahead of time that uh, what your air draft is so that they can arrange for opening those bridges. Yeah, because some of the bridges are on the out when you're leaving. And if they don't know in advance, then you're stuck in the lock waiting for them to remedy that. Yeah. So one thing we really liked was the hospitality of the yacht clubs. Um, the Walla Walla Yacht Club is up towards the end of the Columbia, just before it makes the turn north towards the Tri-Cities. Mm -hmm. And the people there were so amazing. When we called them and said that we are in the area, they immediately showed us the um, um, the guest slip and the showers and the kitchen and anything else that they could possibly offer us. We told them we were gonna hike to the Twin Sisters, which is this photo here. And one of them offered um, their cell phone number just in case we wanted them to come drive and pick us up so we didn't have to walk all the way back, that they would come pick us up. Um, so super nice people, super um, hospitable. Um, they had a big barbecue one day, um, invited us to join. They had a concert up on one of the um, boathouses and the guest dock where we were um, tied up happened to be right below where the band was playing. So our stern became a dance floor and we joined in their little um, Saturday night party. So um, just super nice people there at the Walla Walla. And a uh, similar experience in the Clover Island Yacht Club. Um, that's in Kennewick. That's in Kennewick. Uh, we came in, there is a public dock and we tied up there first and we kind of walked over on the Clover Island and we're just checking things out. This is a, this is a club where they, uh, they're all motor boaters. 
and we just told them we're up on a trip and, and everything else. And they're like, yeah, don't tie up at the public dock and pay them. Just come over to our side and, you know, we'll give you a key. We've got nice clean showers. We've got everything. They had a laundry facility. Laundry they facility. Had... <laughs> yeah, it was it was great. And then on the way back, they're like, oh, when you're coming back, you know, plan to be here for our Oktoberfest. So that was, you know, we were at Oktoberfest at Clover Island and Halloween party for the SIYC event. Um, but they, they're like, yeah, we're sold out, but you're special. So you can just tie up and, you know, just come on to the, party. come on, come on to the party. Um, they had dueling pianos set up and everything else. So, uh, they, they had, uh, several people have like, uh, ordered special songs for us to honor our, our trip and everything else. So the hospitality was <laughs> truly just amazing. Uh, I would say even in Richland, we were at the public docks there. Um, but, but the local club, everybody said, if you need anything, let us know. Um, yeah, even, Clover Islands where they gave me their car keys so I could go run to the grocery store. Cause it wasn't walking distance, but one of the ladies there is just like, here, take my car. It's the white SUV outside. Um, so which brings us to provisioning the pink jobs, um, Columbia river, every few towns there's grocery stores um the dows it's like a two mile walk each way but there's a big grocery store um there's grocery stores in arlington and kennewick or not kennewick um umatilla yep. when you get to the tri-cities you have to have a car so either the kind people at the yacht club lend you their car or you take an uber um but once you leave the columbia there is not a single place to get any groceries of any kind um until you get to clarkston so we ended up eating more of our packaged foods and canned foods. Um, we organized everything, of course, with uh, what can we freeze, label all of your cans so that the if the labels tear off as you're pulling them in and out of the bilge, that you still know what's inside that can. Learned that trick. Um, lots of expensive Costco stops um, to make sure that we had all of those provisionings. Um, but yeah, when we went... Um, from Tri-Cities up to Clarkston, we basically got the, the joy of going for, I think, two and a half weeks um, with, all right, well, what we have on the boat is all there is because there's nothing else. And there was, except there was something else. Um, we actually were able to, quote unquote, live off the land. Uh, as, as long as we were in the Columbia, especially kind of up to maybe the Dallas, um, for example, uh, Beacon Rock. Beacon Rock has giant bushes of blackberries. I mean, you can just, we, we, we grabbed the boat hook and we just pulled them down and, and had bowls and bowls and bowls of blackberries. I got extra Ziplocs and froze them. Froze them, yeah. <laughs> so, so we had that. And then once we were up on the Snake River, we found peach trees right, right next to the, to the marina or right next to right in the park where we were docked. So that made for some, uh, some yummy breakfasts. And uh, we were able to, to enjoy some, some fresh fruits while we were out. Um, that was always fun. Um, some of our favorite stops along the river, and you probably know this just even being on the lower Columbia, uh, we always find it difficult to choose between, do we go wine tasting or do we go to the brewery and have a pizza? So we always have to say, okay, if we're going out tonight, is it a wine night or a pizza or a beer night? Um, so plenty of options there. Just have to pick, uh, pick what you want to do. Um, that also allows you to restock some of the stores for, uh, for the cruising. And um, we found a couple of, uh, couple of vineyards where they still had uh, vines out. And they're like, yeah, you can go taste this. And then you can go come and taste, grab the, a bunch, the, yeah. taste the wine that was made from those same grapes. So it was actually a kind of a cool wine tasting experience because we got to taste the grapes and the product at the same time. And then on the right-hand side, the picture is, uh, we were at a uh, barbecue place in Clarkston and they had the Lewiston brew and the Clarkston um, uh, beer as well. So it was, we had it side by side together. So fun spots along the way. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a lot of them. Yeah, so Cascade Locks is one of our favorites always, um, which we've been to many times. There's a fish market in Cascade Locks um, that is the best fish and chips you're ever going to eat. Um, a couple of breweries there. Um, the Gorges Brewery is our favorite just because of the rooftop view, as you can see there. Um, it's also just beautiful place to walk around. Um, Thunder Island is a little island between the old locks, which is what you see pictured there that are not operational anymore. 
Um, but the sunsets and the bridge and just that whole little town is just amazing. Yeah. Yeah. One one word of advice, though, as uh, as you pass Bridge of the Gods, you can literally be at the bridge, which is here in the picture and be looking upstream and where you are, it'll be no wind. It'll be flat calm. And around the corner, around Thunder Island, you'll have four to six foot swells and 30, 30 knot wind. So if you see white caps ahead, again, there is a reason for that. And, um, yeah. and we've experienced that on a number of surprised. occasions going through Cascade. One thing Locks. about Cascade Locks is there's no electric and no water. Um, so it's a beautiful guest dock that is free. And, you know, we've never actually even seen anyone there as far as working there. So yeah. you just go tie up, but there's no facility. There's no resources there. There is a pump, pump out, out, but in the winter time, the pump out's closed because they turn off all the water. Um, so just come prepared for that. Um, one of our favorite anchorages is Miller Island, um, which was just past the Dow's Dam. Yeah. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So past the second dam, um, you tuck behind this island that has these big, beautiful rocks, obviously. Um, and there's just a quaint little anchorage back there. It's actually um, right at the foothills of the Mary Hill Winery. You can't actually get to the winery. There's not even a place to dinghy over there, um, but you can see the winery. It's beautiful. Um, but we just stayed there a few nights, both on the upstream and the downstream, just because the scenery was so incredible and peaceful and there's never anyone there. Um, Crow Butte is up by Boardman, so a little further um, upstream, and it's an Indian reservation, um, and they have public docks there that are super high quality. Um, they had electric, but they didn't want you to plug in your boat power there. So um, it was 20 amp power. Yeah, it was 20 amp power. So they, they only had regular, but we had a converter and we were able to top yeah. off batteries. So um, beautiful place. To beautiful be. park, totally isolated. And there's a winery, Alexandria Nicole, that is three miles up the hill. You have to hike up to go to it. Um, but absolutely gorgeous winery up on the hills there. And that way, after your wine tasting, at least it's a downhill three-mile hike to get back to your boat, which was appreciated. Um, but that was one of our favorite stops. Um, the McNary Yacht Club, we could not get into because it was so overgrown and not dredged. Um, so they suggested we just anchor on the outside of it, um, which was just a gorgeous place to be. Um, but that also included um, Hat Rock on the opposite side. So on the downstream, rather than anchoring there in front of the yacht club, um, since we couldn't get in, we anchored around the other side of the park, which is this, uh, not anchored, sorry, we tied up at the other side of the park, which is Hat Rock. So we were able to go for hikes and kind of walk around to the yacht club and things like that on that side. Gorgeous place. And then Richland, um, which is kind of the end of the road on the Columbia, um, part of the Tri-Cities there. Uh, we jokingly referred to that place as we think these are the friendliest people on the planet. Um, not only were we able to restock and find wine tastings and lots of beautiful hikes and all of that, but every single person in the town of Richland, just with the most sincere smile, would say hello, no matter where you walk into them, just on the walking paths or whatever. Everybody's like, hello, hello, how are you? Where are you from? We just sit, uh, sit on the, <laughs> sit by the river. We walked up to a barbecue nearby and we just sat on the bench by the river looking Every at- Every single person that walked by. And it's, it, even our backs on the bench were towards the, the walkway. And even then people are like really going out of their way to just say hello. We're like, what is going on? What's happening? So we decided they're just not used to getting cruisers up there. And they were just really excited to see people come visit. Um, Fish Hook Park. She's on the Snake. On the Snake River is the second major park upstream on the Snake. Um, on the upstream version, we were there on Labor, Labor Day. Day weekend. And it was just all full of people on pontoon boats and little pleasure craft and playing and jet skis and all of that. On the downstream, it was deserted because the park was closed. Um, and that was just magical for us that we got the whole park to ourselves, and um, no facilities there either. Um, no electricity, no water, no pump, no out, pump out, nothing. Um, but just a magical secluded little spot that um, we got to take over. I think we stayed there like four or five days on, on, the, the, downstream. on the downstream. Yeah. yeah. Did they have uh, uh, short toilets? 
They're like a they, bit, they're they they Labor Day weekend, yes, but yeah, they, they were, were all open. locked up. They were all locked up on the downstream because the park was closed. Yeah, that was that was another kind of a learning is that everything after Labor Day pretty much shuts down. They they do tell you openly, they're like, you can you can tie up, you can you can stay as long as you want. Uh, but there is just no short side service. As a matter of fact, the gate to the Fishhook Park was completely closed when we went out for, for a little walk. Walks. the other way, yeah. Um, so, so you're okay to be there, but, uh, but again, you have to be self-sufficient. So um, a little bit further up from Fishhook was uh, Anchor Canyon. There is a U.S. Coast Guard has a, has a mooring buoy there. So again, in our uh, little experience that we have, uh, we were able to tie up on, on the mooring and just hang out there for, for overnight, which was again, very nice, very peaceful, uh, surrounded by, by the rocks and everything else. It was, it was really nice to just kind of relax there and, and be at the mooring. Um, further up still on the Snake River, there is a, an island called New York, New York Island. The make, main channel goes one side and then there is kind of a not too shallow, but but shallow enough to anchor in. So we anchored there and we had some amazing days. Uh, just a so couple, couple of nights, I think we stayed there. Um, super still. Again, nothing nothing anywhere around to rush towards or even if you were on a dinghy, uh, you can explore, but there is there is no other places to go. Um, the, the landscape is uh, is very different. I mean, just the, the dryness and the being in the water yet seeing the arid countryside is is really really interesting and um we had a number of days some days that were a little bit more windy and then some days that were completely flat uh so we just motored along create a little wake and um and enjoyed the the scenery so the last place we wanted to mention is Silcott Island, um, which is just before you get to Clarkston, um, just before you get to Cell Signal or anything else. Um, but it's just a little um, campground there. And they've got a tiny little dock that was lots of weeds and everything overgrown. Um, and when we went to the park keeper person, he was like, when we said, hey, we're here on a boat, he kept pointing at the land where we and could drive our trailer and we could put our boat. And we're like, no, we're like on a boat. And he's like, well, I don't understand. Can't you just park in that parking spot? And then there's a ramp and you can put your boat in the water. And we're yeah. like, no, 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 we are on the boat. And finally we like pointed down to their dock and they're like, oh, we've never had anybody tie up there before. Um, which kind of surprised us that they just literally don't get any people on boats. Yeah. Um, but we loved that place. It was just, again, we like the secluded. We like the no one ever comes here kind of parts of the trip. Yeah. So speaking of no, nobody ever comes here, the, the final destination was Clarkston. Um, and uh, the, the place where we kind of researched and even called ahead was called Hell's Canyon Resort. And it was an interesting. You notice I put resort in air quotes yeah. or in quotes there. <laughs> yeah. Resort is a strong word. <laughs> yeah, big R, big RV park next to it, but the but the marina. I mean, it's there. Um, you can't quite tell from this picture where Grace is tied up, but I think the dock only came up came up about sixty percent of the length of the boat, um, and there were some strong winds expected, and those docks did not inspire confidence. Uh, as a matter of fact, when we were pulling in, I called in on the cell phone finally because uh, there was nobody on VHF. So I called the, the marina office and I said, you know, we're, we're coming upstream. We would like to come in like, you know, do you have a dock or where, where do we go? And they couldn't wrap their head around. They're like, well, just go off on the side where the lawn tramp is and uh, tie up there. And we started approaching it. And first of all, the uh, depths were like less than eight feet. I'm like, I'm not sure I want to be going in here. And then the docks had no cleats, no, no, uh, it wasn't even a rail, no, no rail, nothing to tie up. It and it was just, hood. and the water was like splashing on the dock. I'm like, this is not going to work. So we kind of made a U-turn. I called back into the office and I said, no, no, no. I said, I think we're going to need to come into the marina and tie up there, you know, more permanently. And of course, at this point, we're kind of worried. We're like, okay, what's our alternative here? Um, and they said, well, I just talked to the manager and uh, we haven't been dredged in a long time. So um, we think maybe four and a half feet you can go in. So Adrian goes down below, cranks up the keel. And luckily we made it into the marina, which gave a lot of people pause how that size of a boat made it into the marina. Um, and then of course we had, uh, we had our visitor welcoming committee 
So there's a guy that lives there on one of these tiny little boats and he saw a sailboat coming in and he was just so excited to see another boat that he ran all the way around the marina and ran to catch our lines. It was a little over anxious in doing that. Um, but the first words he said when he was in earshot is, you're the first visitors this year. And mind you, this is like, you know, September. mid September. And he just was so excited to greet us and like wanted to like show us around and give us his car and anything he can do. And let me give you a list of every restaurant and let me show you where the laundry is. And, and he told us that they only had one pleasure craft come up last year at all and that nobody in 2021 had been there and that to him this was just such a joy that someone would actually come up river so we're like okay I guess we're the first yeah and this is a picture of so a little bit further upstream there is a like a public dock uh there's a restaurant and a barbecue and a brewery and a winery just just short walking distance from it so uh the marina had uh, shore power um pump out was somewhere further down where we didn't dare to go even with our swing keel mm -mm. um but uh but the public dock is there and it's available um we also went uh for a day trip as we called it to idaho uh we tied up at this uh at this dock and we were okay to be there during the day but again it's one of those places where if there was uh, a wind to pick up or something like that overnight certainly no services but good enough to tie up during the during the day but i'm not sure i'd want to uh overnight there uh, let us hike around lewiston a little yeah that was that was really a nice uh, really nice to again get to the lewis and clark historical focus and just read all the signs and and walk around and everything else um in the town there you can tell all the native american history that this is like a wave created out of uh canoes uh, a lot of different art, a lot of different uh, approach to kind of displaying the history there. So we wanted to go beyond the Blue Bridge since that's what stopped us from going further. So we ended up taking a jet boat tour up to see Hell's Canyon. Um, one thing I did not realize when we embarked on this is Hell's Canyon is North America's deepest river gorge. It's about 8,000 feet and it's deeper than the Grand Canyon, which I had no idea. That's right there in Idaho. So we took a riverboat cruise and went and explored up that way. And that was a lot of fun. We also spent five days just in that area, just regrounding, reprovisioning, making sure that we were ready for the downstream trip. Yeah. So that was, that was kind of covering all the different uh, bridges and dams and all the different places. But of course, going up there, we, we've been working on our boat and doing refits and everything else. So I'm just going to uh, highlight a couple of things. We got a you know new chart plotter, uh, new uh, triducer, new radar. Um, you can see on the right hand side, obviously, is any project on the boat. You've got to you know take half half the boat apart to to get to anything. Um, this was just uh, prior to it. I was uh, <laughs> at the boat yard, standing on the rails, probably not OSHA approved, um, helping to mount the AIS antenna and the radar on our radar pole. Uh, so we, we had our hands full and, uh, this was, this was actually when it was hundred plus degrees Two days before we left. Yeah. Yeah. hundred plus degrees. And the workers are like, okay, it's two o'clock. Either we're going to splash you and go home, or you're going to be here for, for another weekend. So we really had to work through it. Um, again, because of self-sufficiency, we had, um, uh, the, the original, uh, way these batteries were wired where three batteries were the house bank and one battery was the starter battery. So what I ended up re, redoing this is I made all four of these a house bank. So that increased our capacity by a third and then uh, set up a separate starter battery. That was very helpful to have in place. Um, anytime there was a project, you can see a supervisor was uh, making sure that her subjects were uh, duly performing the work ordered. Um, and one thing that we did along the way that was kind of a lot of fun is, so we have a, a wheel in the cockpit that was kind of wrapped with um, like twine or like something. Paracord yeah, paracord or, whatever, or something. Yeah. And it was 30 years old. It was, um, it was stuck. So an X-Acto knife and several hours of just one line at a time pulling it off. Um, but then Peter um, spent over a hundred hours putting it back on during this trip. Loop tie, loop tie. Loop tie, loop tie. So we would have a half done wheel and then we'd put it back on to get to the next destination. <laughs> and then we'd have a, you know, one more rung and then put it on. And then the, um, the 
Turk's head on the top to indicate center of the wheel. I think Peter might have watched like 150 YouTube videos of different styles of Turk's head. And um, that got its own probably 100 hours of input as well. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was fun to have something something to focus on, and something to meditative to to work on. Uh, something that was not meditative, as you can you can <laughs> see from my scowl on the uh, as I'm digging in the lazarette there, is um, as we were coming downstream and our motivation was to meet up with uh, SIYC at the Halloween cruise. Uh, temperatures were dropping into the 30s suddenly. And uh, for one reason or another, our diesel heater decided uh, not to work. Um, so at one point we actually had to consider that we would come into the cruise, stay during the day and then move on so that we can get on shore power and, and not have freeze, heat. Yeah. have heat. So, um, again, uh, it was only by the help of the Admiral that, uh, we figured out kind of what was going on, took it all apart. If you want to know what all the parts are of a, of a heater, we, I, we can tell you, we can also tell you how to bench test it with a <laughs> bottle of diesel and a fuel pump in hand and everything else, just to make sure that it's running. Um, it was, it was a very frustrating process, but as, as always, you know, you do what you do and then you kind of look back at it and you say it was totally worth it. It's a, it's a, it's a cool story to have and it's an experience and we know way more about diesel heaters and wiring and everything else than we ever wanted to know. So reflections were often asked. Um, so what was the most surprising? What was scary? People ask us these things all the time. So um, we decided just to include a few of those items. The most surprising thing is like nobody's out there. We had the whole river to ourselves, other than an occasional commercial um, barge to a point where even when the trains pass by, they would toot their horn at us because they were so shocked to see a sailboat up there. And we would wave back at them and we had the air horn out. So it's like the trains were our only friends um, up the Snake River for sure. Yeah. Um, the most scary was probably the Dallas Lock experience. It really shows you kind of the power of the of the elements around you. And uh, we really felt just like a little eggshell in a, in a giant concrete canyon. Um, so we, we gained a very healthy respect for uh, the locking procedure and never underestimate it. Uh, the most peaceful was New York Island. Um, we wish we could have stayed there like for a week, but it was just totally still and gorgeous and was the day we actually used the word frolic. It was the day we frolicked and just jumped in the water and played and just totally checked out. The most stunning was the um, basalt cliffs up on the upper Snake River. Um, my jaw was on the ground just sailing through all of this. It was absolutely incredible. Yeah, and this is uh, this is Cape Horn, about halfway up to um, Beacon Rock, uh, uh, halfway up to Beacon Rock from Portland. Um, again, beautiful cliffs, beautiful area, and uh, and all of this is literally within an easy day sail uh, from all of our uh, home marina. So uh, the the most inspiring part of this is there's so much in our own backyard uh, if we're just willing to to get out and go explore. So. That's the end of the formal part of the presentation. Um, we've got a lot of different things uh, on our blog, just kind of from our own experiences. Uh, if there is interest, we'll, we can put together some of the resources um, about the dams and uh, about the different you know, mile markers and marinas and, and, and resources. One thing actually I found helpful when it comes to the dams, um, I had to Google it. So the very first day as we're heading up to Beacon Rock, one last story for the for the finish here, is we're, we're motoring because the wind's not really working in our favor. So we're motoring and I can I can I pretty much monitor the, the engine and the consumption and the RPMs and how fast are we moving and everything else. And the whole time we're going, I'm like, are we dragging something? Like what, what is going on? Well, Long story short, it took us way longer to get to Beacon Rock motoring than we expected. And when we got there, we could see the current at Beacon Rock was really strong. And uh, when we pulled up there, there's a couple other boats there and they're like, oh yeah, they because it was so hot, they said, oh, they're releasing extra water because they need the power generation so that people can run their air conditioning. So the whole time we're pushing through and, and uh, we even checked the 
check the website. And so there is a website that literally show you each hour or you, maybe even eat every 15 minutes, how much water is being released. Release schedule, and yeah. so you can see what the, what the uh, normal is and, and what the pattern is. So then you can plan accordingly so that you're not going at two o'clock in the afternoon when they're releasing the most water and you have to fight some you know seven knot currents. So uh, let me pause this presentation. There we go. So, so that was, um, that was our experience. That was our uh, trip. And um, again, as you can probably tell, we're very excited about um, the trip and, and just encouraging others to, to try it out. And we'd love to hear your responses or questions or comments or anything else. Peter, George, are you going to uh, write a book about it? <laughs> well, we, we do joke with Kay and Fred, with whom we're very much in touch. They've kind of become our mentors, and, and uh, I can't tell you how much we appreciate their, their help, um, both just in, in terms of cruising and life and, and the boat. Um, but I jokingly told Kay and Fred, you know, I said the best book is still to come. So um, not sure if there's going to be a specific book about the upriver trip, but, uh, but I would not be surprised as we explore the Pacific Northwest that uh, there might be some additional writing. Right now, we're just really getting off the ground and starting to write some posts on our, on our webpage. And uh, I would not be surprised if that accumulates into, into a book at some point. I wonder on the SIYC website if there's any way to share some of this uh, information. Uh, people would be able to uh, look it up and and uh, reap from your experiences. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the ideas I had, and and just kind of life got in the way, if you will. But uh, one of the ideas I had was just kind of maybe not writing a book, but writing an upstream kind of guide with all the research that we've collected and the different links and everything else. So I would certainly be once I get around to compiling that, I would certainly be happy. Uh, hopefully, it's before the next season when somebody's considering. Uh, but I would be happy to, to share that. I think that would be awesome to have other people benefit from it. Peter, Craig here. I, I think that just your spreadsheet would be valuable. Okay. That had that had the the uh, information had the the email addresses and yep. phone numbers. Uh, just that. Maybe uh, you could yeah. post post that uh, you know as an as a resource on the website. I'd be happy to. Yeah, I'd, yeah, we'll I'd like to re I'd like to request that you give us the uh, web address for your blog. Yeah, just, okay, I will post it into the chat and uh, we'll make sure. It's actually in the newsletter, Barbara. You added it oh, last that's month. Right. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Never mind. <laughs> that, that's true. Actually, at yeah, the, at the end of the. It. At the end of the newsletter, there is there is that, but I'll post it here in the chat. Um, if you just want to read about some of the some of the adventures we've had, and uh, we'll we'll create a page or share the spreadsheet or put it up on SIYC. We'll figure out an appropriate place to put it. Yeah. I, I just want to say, my wife Susan and I, unlike any of the members of SY, I, I, I see that uh, we stay on the river. And we've been from Astoria to Hood, Hood and really enjoy it. And we go out every year. And this is really inspiring. I'm, I'm so interested in detail and your experiences. This was a whole lot of fun. Very much. Awesome. It, it, was a, it was a blast. And I will say for those of you that have been up to Hood River, you can literally go about, what, an hour upstream of Hood River and you can watch the landscape change dramatically. The, probably the starkest change in terms of landscape, just the, uh, the immediacy, of, immediacy it. Yeah. of it is between Hood River and the Dalles. Yeah, some of us would have to get that guy to come open the bridge at Hood River though. <laughs> yep. mm -hmm. Yeah, which was, uh, as I recall, was a phone call at a couple of days wait time for him to find a time in his schedule to come open the bridge. Actually, it wasn't an impressive thing for them either. Uh, they don't have very many people asking. And when we asked, uh, they said it actually is a great opportunity to make sure that the lubrication on the bridge is working and that everything is the way it's supposed to work. So you're doing him a favor. Yes. George, I know you went to Lewiston. What, what's the air draft on, on your boat? Uh, no, we didn't get to Lewiston. We uh, only got up to Miller Island, uh, oh. and we're 60 feet. 60 feet, okay. We'd go bump. 
we'd bump into the bridges. You'd bump into some of those, yeah. Peter, anybody else have questions, Mark? Yeah, Peter, just wondering, what would you say is the minimum draft or uh, keel that you would recommend? Uh, a draft for a keel? Yeah. I think you can easily do it with, you know, even a seven, eight feet. I, I don't think that would be a problem. Well, you um, can't get into the Hell's Canyon Resort. Well, the, but there were this public docks on the outside that were fine. Yeah. They were great. Um, actually, on the way, we met another powerboat. They were on a Nordhaven 41 or something like that, mm. maybe 40. Um, they had a six and a half foot draft. And, um, and they made it all the way they up. Made it, they made it all the way up and into some, some pretty tight marinas, as a matter of fact, in Aragon. Uh, which was just above Boardman. Uh, we were going in and we thought about going in there, but it was blowing wind and- um, Super narrow entrance. Google, uh, Google Maps, when you switch to the earth view to, the, to, to see the satellite view, uh, was very helpful. And we could tell that, that the entrance was gonna be very tight and the maneuvering was gonna be very tight it's probably not a good day to try to enter well, and one where the guy in the fishing boat like one of the little fishing boat boat hook and he asked he so he went and in, into the marina entrance with his boat hook and he concluded that he thought it was at least six feet but you could tell he was pulling up weeds every time he was pulling the boat hook yeah. up so yeah, I don't think I don't think draft would be a really limiting but factor. We ended I mean, up going in there, just there, for the record. We did end up going in on the downstream, and it was actually fine. Yeah, so it's there's, more there's, of an outside issue than it is a depth issue. Yeah, it's 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 a maneuvering issue, and it's a uh, the weeds were actually an issue. I had to clean the uh, intake strainer so many times. As a matter of fact, at Aragon, when we went on the downstream, it completely clogged our through hole. So I had the I had everything taken apart. The, the valve fully open and there was not a drop of water coming in. I had to like jam it in from the inside and push it out until the water started coming in and, and clean it out. But that, but that was, was fine. Yeah, that was fine. So it was just, again, it tested our skills, you know, might be very self-evident to a lot of you, but uh, it tested our skills as far as, you know, checking in the, the intake strainers, checking in just all the different things and being able to be self-sufficient. So we, we felt like it was a great, uh, great experience to, to explore. Thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you soon. Likewise. Peter, I think you and Adrian deserve some kind of a seamanship award for doing a U-turn in uh in a 37 foot boat in in what was it what did you say it was 80, 86 feet 86, 86 feet. foot wide and and you had a, a strong stern wind at the time right yes yeah yes. i i know from personal hard-earned experience that we could not do a u-turn even if the room was there because we would blow off from the bow as we tried to turn around, the wind would be keep blowing the bow off. All we would do is drift down sure. downwind into the until we hit the door. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We would be better off, uh, you know, just trying to back up, uh, you know, full screaming engine uh, to try to back up. It obviously depends on your on your boat, but people ought to be aware of things like that about how their boat handles in a strong breeze, and that would be something you could practice in less dangerous. Uh, circumstances. It's not condition to try it. You're right. Yeah, you know, try it out in the in the open channel. Uh, yeah, we we like to practice sometimes just coming into a marina or some of the some of the docks um, that that we've been to. Just uh, you know, just the maneuvering and how much port kick and when does it when does the rudder start uh, grabbing when we're in reverse and those kind of things. Um, and again, we're far from experts at this. Um, I'm not sure if I had the time to really think it through and knowing that because we were definitely drifting sideways, um, I'm not sure I would do it again or I would recommend it necessarily, but <laughs> that's what was, that, that's what in my mind was available to us before we got to the fourth bit and hit the wall. So um, knock on wood, it, it worked out. Could, could you have backed into that wind or, or did the motor not have enough power? I, I probably could have backed into the wind, but we were closer. It's just there was no bit to 
tie up to. And at that point, the port would have started taking me too close to the wall for comfort. You know, and the other thing is these locks, the, the lowest lock is Bonneville, which is, I think, 72 or 76 feet, and they go all the way up to 105 foot. So they're double our air draft. So yeah. your spreaders and everything else, I mean, so even if you is you know we we didn't want to hit the rig very cylinder and it's about it's a it's a, it's a blow up fender um and, and we I just put it on the midship cleat yeah. so it covers the whole boats where you can actually use it as a roller to roll up your boat up on shore like a dinghy or something like that um and i think for i don't know 60 bucks or whatever that was um it's been a it's been a great kind of peace of mind because even when you're at the bits and you just have regular fenders, it's very possible that your fenders or both of them at the midship could fall into the cutout where the bit is. So this kind of uh, really helps with, uh, with the locking. When, when we went through all the locks in Sweden, we finally got a board and made a fender board. And so we would have a couple of fenders hanging off the side, then an outboard of that would be this board tied to the rail. And so the fenders bear on the board, the bore board gets trashed up against the wall. Um, that also works if you have to tie up to like a single piling mm -hmm. or something, because then the fender will bear on the piling and the boat bears, you know, uh, the, I mean, the board bears on the piling yep. and, and, and um, just a piece of two by 10, you know, was, was enough. That's awesome. It's a good idea. What type of uh, prop do you have? Is it a fixed prop? No, it's a it's a folding prop. And uh, three blade. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and the silhouette of your uh, keel without the swing in it when it's, it's fully a, deployed. It's it's a fin keel. It is. It, it's kind of a triangular. I can find a picture, but uh, so your wind, uh, your bow would blow off. Uh, it wasn't being held up by the keel. Yeah, and we don't have a bow thruster. Right, right, right. Well, that's that's what Adrian does, right? Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Adrian with a stick is like a bow thruster in the water, yeah. right? There you go. But there is a limit to what that little flimsy aluminum boat hook will, will handle when you start pushing on it, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. That's when you wish you had the stout oak. Uh, you know, an uh, inch and a half oak bout hook. Uh, uh, I, will, hook. I will reiterate again is it is it is a different experience and it does require skills and focus and, and everything else going through the locks. But um, I, I would say, you know, prepare, but don't be afraid of it. Uh, prepare, but don't be afraid of it. Um, the, the upstream is a little bit, uh, you know, the turbulence and everything. The downstream is almost just like, you know, just the water goes out of the water, down, bathtubs, yeah. you know, no big deal. Um, but communication, being prepared, um, and you'll find what works for your boat too. So there were a couple of days where we basically said, because the other thing I wouldn't try personally doing is, uh, so the barges, when they go from Lewiston to Portland, they do the whole trip in 48 hours. Oh. Um, the the cruise ships that go up and down the river uh, that you see every once in a while, the American Empress and, and those kind of cruise ships, they do it in about six days. Um, and so often we saw them come by at night and we're just like, this is just the, some of the most beautiful scenery. Like, why would you skip that type of thing? So um, I, I would I would allocate plenty of time. And and with the time, I would say, I don't think we, we would be interested in doing two locks in the same day, unless it's like truly middle of the summer where, you know, you've got daylight from five o'clock in the morning till 10 at night, maybe then you can do, but I don't, I don't think- We that never did feel, more than one in a day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a comment about long cruises. Um, when we crossed the South Pacific, I think that we were on the high seas one day for about every three or four days that we were uh, anchored out in a lagoon somewhere. Yep. Um, going to Alaska, it was like two days 
motoring, you know, for every day that we got to stop somewhere, maybe three days motoring, and it was a bad ratio. And so people who are going to do long cruises, I mean, weeks or months, uh, really need to consider that they should, they should have more time stopped and, and exploring than, than underway. If you figure you're going to be underway every three out of four days, you're going to find yourself really pushed. Yeah. And um, I think your experiences were going upstream with the wind behind you. You had more time to kill and, and, and you know, coming, coming down, you had to push, 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 right? It, it, to motor and, and, yeah. and make yeah. your miles. There, there was a few days where we tried to tack our way downstream and um, it's a narrow river. It's a narrow river. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of shore tacking. So, um, I mean, it's fun. We love the, we love the act of sailing itself. And uh, we, you know, when you look at our stats, it was probably three out of four days. We were, we were underway in some way, shape or form. The good news is in many places, um that day might have been you know 10 or 12 or maybe 15 miles so it wasn't that long of a distance so we could it's little hops yeah we could start we could get in we could explore and so it didn't feel like you know we're underway all day long type of thing it was more of a short hop but there were several places where it's like okay there is not a whole lot to stop in between and and the other thing to, to pay attention to and i'll i'll note it in the in the spreadsheet is once you get, uh, let's say, above Miller Island, uh, anchoring, I mean, you really have to pick and choose if you want to anchor out somewhere because of those, those basalt cliffs that are on the shore, they run all the way down into the, into the, into the river. So tossing out an anchor may, may not have uh, anything to grab onto. Yeah, there's and, places, well, much of the Snake River, it's 100 feet up until the cliff sides. Yeah. So there is no place to anchor. You just have to keep going. And the anchor wouldn't have anything to grab into. Yeah. Wow. Well, Craig, uh, you want to uh, close things? Well, down? I just, I, yeah, just thank, thank you guys for the uh, for a wonderful presentation. I hope everybody found found it as interesting as I did. So, you know, great. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you Thank it was our pleasure to share it with you. And like I said, if anybody has any specific questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we've done it once. So um, our, our information is based on that data set, but we'll share what we have. Yeah, and we'll share the spreadsheets that we talked about. Yeah.